Okay, we've been studying, studying a series on the first and second Peter, and uh, we're going to be uh, covering uh, verses 10 through 16 of chapter 1, first Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. Uh, to appreciate uh, such passages, we need to come in contact with our own uh, values that are messed up. Uh, we want the goodies. Uh, we want all the goodies. Uh, that's what matters above all. And our young people are especially trained to do that, right? Uh, we adults also, but especially our young people. Just give me the goodies. Just give me the goodies. Don't make me work for it. Don't make me, okay, if I have to work for it, I will, but I just want the goodies. That, that, that's all that matters. The goodies meaning what the world offers. Or getting the power. Getting the power, getting the power, getting the power. That's all that matters. And in this world, the means or the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. What does that mean? That means that it doesn't matter how I get the power. If it's unethical, it doesn't matter. If it's lying, cheating, it doesn't matter. As long as I get the power that I want. You see? If I end up hurting people or uh, it's a little unethical, it doesn't matter. If I lie to the Congress, if I lie to my church, if I lie to people, if I only put on a good face all the time and I'm really misrepresenting what's really going in my soul, it doesn't matter. As long as I get the power that I want. Now respect me, will you? If you don't, then I get mad. We live in such times um, as long as I get what I want. Well, what's truly valuable? What's truly valuable? And this is where, again, our value systems are, uh, need to be readjusted, canceled, uh, renewed, uh, whatever you want to call it. Matthew 6, you want to be turning there by way of introduction. Matthew 6. Uh, these are words from Jesus. Jesus, uh, as most of us know, is the creator of all that is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him, and nothing that is created was created without Him. He is the owner of all that is. He is the sovereign Lord of all that is. And this is who's speaking. This is who is speaking these words. It's not me. I'm going to read what he said. Okay. Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your, trust, your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp of the body, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot. There's a finality to that. You cannot serve God and wealth. The eye of the body, meaning the perspective. How you see the world, how you see yourself, how you see God, how you see what really matters. If your eye, if your perspective is bad, then your whole body is bad. 
If you have the right perspective, then there's tremendous light in all that you do in life. And what is it that we should, what's the right perspective? Don't put your treasures here on earth, man. They're going to be gone. Have your treasures in heaven. And the center part, the center part of all this is verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Meaning, the highest value, the simum bonum of your life, that's where your energies, your heart, your efforts, your mind, your emotions, your everything is going to go into. Whatever is the highest good for you. And Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is saying, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And there's no middle ground here. There's no middle ground. I'm not saying that. Jesus is saying that. So what is the highest value? Power? Success in this world? Or the things of heaven. You see, all of a sudden, we need to raise a bunch of other questions. How am I living? Do people know that I have heaven as the highest good? Is it very obvious? Or is my anger and frustration, uh, because I'm not getting what this world offers, what really shows the most? When I fight with my wife, why am I fighting with her? Because I want the kingdom of heaven in her heart? Or because she's not giving me what I want? What am I living for? My children, the church, why I work? It raises a lot of questions. And many of us are frustrated and we give in because our values are all messed up. And especially when, it is especially difficult when all of those around us, at all levels, at the national level, at the state level, at the county level, at the city level, at the neighborhood level, at the church level, at the family level, at the church level, at the personal level even, not right. They're not doing what's right. And so it can become very, very discouraging. Very discouraging. And that's why we need the word of God to enter in and show us what is truly valuable. And what really, really matters. Because if not, I can waste five, ten 30, 60, 70 years down the drain because I had the wrong values. Working for something and climbing the ladder, but that ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. First Peter is writing to believers who are suffering. Believers who are going through very, very hard times. And he is encouraging them. Last week we said in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verses 3 through 9, um, we said that God com God's complete salvation is to be the foundation for our Christian lives. God's complete salvation is to be the foundation for all that we do as Christians. Right? And that salvation is an awesome, awesome salvation. So, what are you being moved by? Does the gospel move you to the point of, oh, yes. And if not, why not? Maybe our values are a little messed up. In this passage, verses 10 
through 16, we find that having so great a salvation, if we understand, and this salvation that includes not just uh, that Jesus came and died for our sins, and when we believe we're going to heaven, is much more than that. It's growing in this life, becoming more like Christ, being a, having a character that can really have impact in a powerful way for the kingdom of God. And then when we do get to heaven, there's going to be glories and honors because we live for Christ. But as someone said, some of us are going to get saved by our chinny chin chin. <laughs> We're going to be saved, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, yet as through fire. Barely going to get our underwear cinched because we barely made it in. <laughs> no. We are here to live in such a powerful way that we can impact people. You see. If we understand this salvation. And so this is what now Peter is going to now uh, tell the believers. This salvation, he's going to expand on this salvation and... How then are we to live? What's the, what's the, what are the first things that we need to looking at so that we can grow in a solid way and move forward in the Christian life in the midst of suffering? In the midst of this ungodly, vile, darkened world where babies are killed right out of the womb and hearts are harvest. That's ugly. And that's our culture. Much more than that. Young girls being trafficked sexually. Now it's coming out. Oh my goodness. Lying that's going on all the time. It can get so discouraging. <laughs> And there could be temptations to go back. I just want to numb my soul. It's so vile. And Peter is saying, don't lose perspective. Don't lose perspective. You see. Having so great a salvation, we are to live holy lives. That's it. That's the beginning of how we're going to live, right? So let me read this passage, 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 10. He just mentioned all this, you know, the salvation that God has given us, the inheritance, this awesome, awesome salvation, and the growth of our, of our faith that is so precious to God as we, as we make decisions to live for Him. And now He expands now on this salvation, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that were to come, who made careful search and inquiries, seeking to know the person in the time of the Spirit of Christ within them, was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of the Christ and, very important, and the glories to follow. <clears throat> it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. Also, in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. <sighs> Peter.
Peter goes back and says, this salvation, man, the Old Testament prophets really, really wanted to understand the sufferings that this Messiah was to experience and the glories that would follow. But they were not serving themselves. They were serving you. As is happening now, and you can be a part of that. You can be a part just like the prophets. You can be a part of this great, great work of God. But as we said already, sometimes our values need to be changed. Transformed. Because this world has a powerful, powerful magnet that sucks us to itself. And we give in. It is a powerful, it's like it's got this winch with a massive cable around our waists. And it's a powerful winch and it's just sucking us in. That's what the world offers. But this, he said, this salvation, this salvation, uh, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that were to come to you made careful search and inquiries. They really put their mind to it. They took time to study. They took time to ask questions, to examine, to reread, to seek to understand. How many of us take time to really read the Bible for understanding? It's not like, well, you know, a chapter a day keeps the devil away. <laughs> I did my thing, check. I read the whole Bible ten times. What does it mean? I don't know. In the time of Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees memorized whole sections of the Bible. Never mind reciting all of Deuteronomy by memory. No, no, no. Whole sections. They knew their Bible. How do we live it out? You see, asking questions, tough questions. You know, because many of us, I know my theology. Brr, brr, we can spew out all kinds of stuff. How do you live it out? I don't know. I have no idea. This prophet did careful, careful study, examining, considering the effects. Now, what would this mean if I did this? If this means this, what does this mean this? Over here and over there. And they worked hard to understand it. Uh, you know, and the prophets didn't care who liked them or didn't like them. Elisha, some of the king of Assyria came. And you know what Elisha told the king of Assyria? Go take a bath. The king of Assyria was angry. Because the king of Assyria had leper, leprous. He was leprous. And oh, there's a man of God over there. He, he, he can heal you. Man, he took a bunch of good stuff and went over to Elijah, knocked on the door, and go see who that is. Oh, he's the king of Assyria. Tell him to go down to the river and take a bath. <laughs> That's really what happened. He didn't care. You know? Jeremiah, decades proclaiming the word of God and people rejecting Solid man. Because he had done careful research and obeying the word of God. Daniel. We're going to throw you into the lion's den. Say when. <laughs> Do it. Don't you know that God is able to deliver us? You're nothing. But if not, doesn't matter. We trust God. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> you know? Someone said, you know why the lion didn't eat Daniel? He's three-quarter gristle and one-quarter backbone. <laughs> Man! 
They had their priorities and their values. And they did careful study. You know, Daniel was reading Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, 70 years. <gasps> 70 years. Daniel said, oh my goodness, the time is up. Because he placed his hope in what the prophets had said. You see? Not what the latest psychology says or the latest newscast, fake news or what have you. The stock market or what the job's going to be. No. What has God said? Careful, careful search of that. How many of us take time to do that? Heaven's sakes, I don't have time. can barely have time to brush my teeth. Mm. There's our values. And specifically, what were the prophets looking for? Verse 11. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ written uh, within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings, the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. Very, very important to understand this passage. The, pro the, pro pro the prophet would say, this person is... What is it going to be like? Oh, and he's going to suffer? What do you mean? What do you mean? Isn't he supposed to be the leader of the world? Isn't he supposed to deliver the Jews from all the enemies and we're to be in the glories? What, what, what is this? They, 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 they just agonized over the text, over the prophecies, and prayed to God for help. You see? Why? Because they were valuing, listen to this, above everything else, they were valuing what God was doing. What God was doing. How many times do we ask the question, what is God up to? Zero times. Or just a few times. It should be all the time. I'm searching, what is God doing? Man, this salvation and the glories to follow? Um, notice, it says, and the glories to follow. Okay, Jesus had already come. Jesus had already died, rose again from the dead. Jesus had already gone to heaven. They were preaching Jesus. Where are the glories? Where are the glories? You see? What does that mean? The glories to follow. The Christians were suffering, man. They were being tortured. They were being rejected. At one point, Nero would put Christians on poles and light them up to light up the city. Glories to follow? What are you talking about? Hmm. You see, we don't ask tough questions. But the prophets, it says there, look again in verse 10. Made careful searches and inquiries. They really put their mind into it. Because they valued what God was doing in this great salvation and the glories to follow. And in all that work, they didn't understand everything. By the way, the prophets did not know that the sufferings of Messiah and the glories to follow were going to be one boom, boom, right after the other. They didn't understand that. That's what they thought. But they didn't understand that there was going to be lots of time. And by now, it's 2,000 years separation between Jesus' sufferings and the glories to come. Mm. 
Verse 12. It was revealed to them. Listen, look at this. Look at this. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in the things which you now have been announced to you. Huh. They were told, listen, man, you're serving future generations. You're, you're serving the, those that are to come. You and I interested in serving the generation to come? How does it show up if we are? Does it really show up? Or is it just good things to say? Are we really saying, you know, the children that are in the other building, they're so valuable. That how can we teach them, nourish them? Because they're going to be the future leaders. Do we really value that? They were taught, you're not serving yourself, man. You're serving those that are coming. You're very interested in serving those that are coming? Many times I'm not. We have to be honest, brothers and sisters. We have to be honest. Because as I said, many times our values are messed up. You see? It's about me. It's about having power and about having all the success. They were made aware. You're not serving yourselves. But you, in these things which you now have been announced to you, through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. God is still sending people to minister to the world. And you and I are invited to be a part of that. You and I are invited to be a part of what God is doing. Sending us into the world that's lost and it's darkened and they need the light. Sending you and me. Things into which angels long to look. Can you imagine that? Angels were there when God created Angels were there all through biblical history. Angels were there when Satan and a third of the angels fell. Angels were there when Jesus came. The birth, oh my goodness, they broke out in a chorus. Glory to God. And the angels knew all this. And now they long for these things that are being preached now, the gospel. And how people are saved. And how they're on their way to heaven. Angels look long to look at that. Do you and I long for people to be saved? And oh my goodness forever and ever they're going to be in heaven. Once again. Sometimes our values. Our values are not where they need to be. You see. Our values are not. What they need to be. So, if we say, okay, Reuben, I repent. <laughs> I really need to change my values. What do I need to do? Well, good question. Where do we begin? We'll now look at the next verse. How do we live now? How do we, how do we, move, how do we move forward? Verse 13, therefore... Given this awesome work of God throughout history, that he promised a savior, that, that prophets really stayed, studied really hard, carefully to understand what God was doing, this salvation to be revealed. They really worked hard, the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow, they really worked hard. And then Christ came. And Christ came and died, rose again from the dead, is in heaven, and now he's sending us. They're like, wow, wow. And then what's coming when Jesus comes? The glory is to come. Therefore, if we understand that, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Your minds, your rationale, 
your intelligence, your thinking, your meditation, the power to put two and two together. Prepare your minds for action. Be sober. Hmm. Be sober. <sighs> Prepare your minds means be alert. Be alert. Stay keenly aware in your mind thinking, thinking. Be sober means um, morally self-controlled. Morally self-controlled. In our times, because all this being offered, all the skin, all the free porn, all the free so much, no. Self-control. To say no. Remember being at a restaurant and they, every TV on had some scantily clad woman coming in and out. I will never come back to that restaurant again. Never. Because it's everywhere. Be alert. Think, man. Ahead of time. Morally self-control. Meaning intensely active and morally pure. Don't be asleep. Oh, I got this. I can think I can handle this. Mm. No. Prepare your minds for action. Be sober. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. Your hope on the grace brought to you at the second coming of Christ. Don't put your hope in this world that things are going to get better, that you're going to make more money, that you're going to get all the goodies, that you're going to get all the respect in all the world. No. I mean, we can long for those things, and those things are good. They're not necessarily bad. But put your hope in the second coming of Christ. Because it's going to get darker, brothers and sisters. I hate to break it down to or tell you, but it's going to get darker. And if we're not used to putting our hopes in the second coming of Christ, it's not going to be good. It's not going to end good. For us or our children. Because listen, we're also putting an example to our children. We're giving an example to everybody else. I, uh, at times I get so discouraged by Christians who just give in. To the latest scare tactics. No strength. You know? <laughs> Lord, Lord, help us. Uh, put your hope in the coming of Jesus. That song from Johnny Cash, the man that comes around, he will come. Yeah, it's a day of reckoning. Yeah. But if our hopes are not in the second coming of Christ, brothers and sisters, we give in so, so quickly. Our confidence in all that is happening needs to be in the second coming of Christ, not in this world. Uh, place all in all satisfaction, safety, fulfillment, happiness on the second coming of Christ. Let me see. As obedient children, verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former, your former lusts. They were yours. 
in your ignorance. You know, when life isn't working, when life gets frustrating more and more and more, you know what we tend to do? We tend to go back to the old ways of escape. The old ways of easing the, the pain in our hearts, in our souls. Whatever it was, you know, TV, drugs, illicit sex, anger, lying, manipulation, you know, secret things we do. Nobody knows, but I have it. And I'm going to turn to that, but it goes, I hurt. I'm going to go buy, buy, buy. I'm going to, whatever we used to do, that's what we turn to. You see? Instead of saying, no, I'm going to live in obedience to Christ. I want to live in obedience to Christ. You see? Do not be conformed to your former lusts in your ignorance. Ignorance? Yes. Ignorance of what God was doing. Ignorance of our own tendencies, our own weaknesses. Ignorance of our, our, our messed up values that were all messed up. Oh, but we thought that was the best thing in the world that I, what I'm doing. And God had to say, no, we need to flush that down the toilet. Because that's not good. Not good. Ignorance of God's wills and his ways. Ignorance of the damage done to our families, our spouse, our neighbors, our friends. We were ignorant of the damage we were doing. You see? Ignorance of what truly is important and satisfying. You see? When life is not working, we tend to go back to those former lusts. But instead of that, verse 15, but like the Holy One, who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Right? To urgently, he's urgently saying, man, accept responsibilities for the particular tasks of holiness that you have before you. Don't look at anybody else how they are failing. No, you. You obey. It's so easy to point the finger. Well, you know, if you, you understood the spouse you gave me, if you understood the hard times I'm going through, you'd understand why I react this ungodly way. That's not going to fly with Jesus. That's not going to fly with Jesus. No. Um... There's an implied relationship right there, right? As obedient children, do not be conformed. I mean, sorry, verse 15. But be like the Holy One. Be like the Holy One. Be like the one who you are in relationship with. Be like the one you say you are in relationship with. But be like the one who called you. Be holy yourselves. In all your behavior. Verse 16. The reason, the reason actually, is because I put you here, I saved you, God is saying, so that you would represent me. So that you would be a reflection of who I am. That's your purpose in living. To represent me. Because it is written. You shall be holy. Why? Because I am holy. And you are to be. Representing me. Right? If we were to understand that. 
Some of us get a picture when we are working for someone and we have to behave a certain way and do some things just the way they want because we're representing them, right? Uh, sometimes our children, oh, well, my parents are going to be ashamed or when my church finds out, oh, my goodness, and they have a sense that they are to represent those above them. Well, here we're to represent God. To represent God. Deuteronomy 8. We've gone through this passage many, many times. There's a thousand ways to apply it. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, says this. Deuteronomy verse 3. Be humble. You, uh, he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Meaning, the way you're going to uh, experience real life, the really Right and good, energetic, holy, satisfying life is by doing the will of God. That's how you're going to experience the power of living. And so, we live for anything else. It's no wonder many times we get discouraged. Right? Again, our values are Skewed, if not altogether messed up. So again, as Christians, uh, to say, man, we have this great salvation and Jesus is coming back. You know what? I want to live a holy life because that's really the real life. And to live for him and to have others understand the gospel and live for him. You see, so how can we apply this? Well, to start off with, we'll study what God has said about the second coming, right? We can need to study what God has said about the second coming. Do we understand that? Do we need to raise more questions? Read Matthew 24 and 25 when you get a chance and ask questions. Read the book of Revelation. Ask questions. Because he is coming back. You see? Read it. Open up the Bible. And it's hard. You know? Uh, but it's worth it. You see? Study the Bible. Study what God has said about his what, second coming of Jesus. Um, you don't have to understand it all. But with, read with an open heart. So that the Lord will teach you through his word. Be open. Lord, Lord help me, Lord. I want to understand. Uh, and then, here's the second application. Not just study what's uh, the second coming of Jesus. How about studying the salvation of God? We think we know it. And we know the basic. We know the center part, right? We know the kernel. Jesus died for our sins, rose again from the dead. And those who believe the gospel are going to heaven. That's the kernel. But man, there's hundreds of things surrounding the gospel that are part of understanding the gospel. The fallenness of man, the grace of God, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. Oh my goodness. The stubbornness of man. The refusal to repent of man. The hardness of man. I mean, my goodness. Lots and lots to understand. But if we don't understand, we simplify it to the point that it becomes irrelevant. Oh, yeah, that's a good story. Yeah, everybody should accept the gospel. And we're not moved by it. Sometimes I'm still, when I study and I go back, tears start coming out of my eyes. The powerful gospel of God. We all need to go back and study the gospel. 
What does it mean? We're so arrogant, think that we know it already, everything about it. I tell people, man, when that movie of The Passion of Christ came out, I saw it at least seven, eight times in a row. Oh, that he did that for me? My goodness. And there's many books. The Message of Salvation by Philip Ryken. It's a great book to read on the gospel. The Message of Salvation by Philip G. Ryken. So study the great salvation of Jesus Christ. Study about the second coming of Christ. And here's my third application. Think about how you are giving in to things you should not be giving in to. Think about the things you're giving in that you should not be giving in to. I'm just going to go down the list. What the Holy Spirit does with you, that's up to him and you. Uh, how about too much TV? If I spend as much time praying as I have spent time watching Star Wars, my goodness, my knees would be gone. Perhaps you need to rethink about your TV. Too much shopping. Even just thinking about it. I want to go buy this. I want to go buy this. I want to go buy this. I want to go check this out. Look on, look on Amazon. Look on eBay. Go to the store. Check it out first. Just thinking about shopping. Maybe too much. Maybe. Hmm. Too much pleasure. Too much pleasure. Too much work. Some of us are workaholics. We don't take time to feed our souls on God and his creation and his work. Work, 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 work. Too much work. Too much lusting. And it doesn't have to be another woman, another man. It can be lusting after that next new thing. Too much lusting. Too much complaining. Too much complaining. Too much putting down others. Always finding the wrong in others. Too much bad language. <coughs> So, maybe make plans on how you are going to change your schedule to feed your soul and others' soul with godly things. Change your schedule so that you can feed yourself, your own soul and the soul of others through godly things. Uh, Reading solid Christian books. Giving loving time to others. You ever plan on that? I'm just going to spend time with that person and give to them. I don't know how it's going to happen. I'm just going to be present and really listen to them. So I can give to them. My attention, my soul, my, my feeling, my, my concern, my support, whatever. Hmm. How about increasing your prayer time? Increasing your prayer time. Getting involved with the church needs. Getting involved with the church needs. How about setting up a goal as to, you know, this is how much I'm going to give to the church. I'm going to set a goal. <laughs> Who's ever done that? Well, how about setting a goal to how you're going to give to the church this year?
And salvation through Christ was of great interest to the great prophets of the Old Testament. Indeed, this salvation is so great that believers are now to be intensely active and morally pure as they put all their hope in the second coming of the great Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our calling. That's our calling. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but in these times, I get uh, exhausted and discouraged. There's so much. There's so much. I got a call this morning. Brother, can you do a funeral? When? Today. All in Spanish. At your service. And I see the faces of old people hurting. Do they know the Lord? <coughs> what are you going to do to change your schedule? To say, you know, God help me with my values. God help me. Help me understand that the second coming of Christ determines everything. Not what I experience in this life. Not what I experience in this life. Will you? It's there. The apostle Peter was encouraging believers. Listen, you're hurting. I know you're hurting. But listen, man, this great salvation and the glories to follow. It's going to be glorious. Glorious. Let that motivate you. Put your hopes in that. So let my life be